Now, I'm really pleased to introduce to introduce a very able facilitator to take us through the rest of the program. Ms. Fiona Gilbert is logging in from Australia. It is late in the night and she is the lead climate finance negotiator for her government and she serves on the Climate Finance Committee of the UNFCCC. So with a lot of pleasure, I am happy to hand over to you, Fiona. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, if you can't, Susan, please let me know. Um, thank you very you. much for that. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Susan. And it's uh, lovely to be with you all. As Susan said, my name is uh, Fiona Gilbert and I am joining you today from Canberra, Australia, where it's meant to be spring, but it feels like a very cold winter day. Um, I am the Assistant Director for Climate Negotiations with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, and as Susan said, I also lead our climate finance negotiations in the UNOCCC. Uh, and within that, I also have the pleasure of co-facilitating the Adaptation Fund Board negotiating items. Um, and with the UNOCCC Standing Committee on Finance, uh, I also co-facilitate the annual flagship forum, which uh, next time will be on financing for nature-based solutions. So there's a little bit of complementarity with this conference too. Um, in addition to that, uh, I also uh, love a different element of my work, which is managing a development program, uh, a community-based uh, de development program, which seeks to harness traditional Indigenous Australian fire management knowledge and combines that with modern science to uh, reduce wildfires. Um, and in fact, Indigenous uh, communities in Australia are able to sell that carbon abatement um, on carbon markets and thereby creating a, an industry worth $100 million in Northern Australia. Uh, the project I manage is actually uh, picking that up and piloting it in Botswana with a fantastic results uh, to date. So that's a really exciting community-based uh, financing project that's a, a unique finance structure as well. Uh, and I'm very happy to speak to any of you about that if you'd like uh, some more information because we are hoping to expand it into other countries in Southern Africa. Uh, so um, back to this session, uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be able to facilitate this session on a very important uh, issue about how multilateral climate funds and multilateral development banks can fill that missing middle. Um, I'm looking forward to our presentations uh, from our experts and also our uh, expert panelists and to the fruitful discussion ahead. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to draw everyone's uh, attention to the Zoom poll, uh, which I will ask Michael to launch now. Uh, the poll is uh, just has, uh, I think, two questions. Um, one is a geographic question about where you are based. Um, and the second question is uh, whether your level of satisfaction with uh, multilateral funds um, on reaching the local level. So I think you have options of strongly agree right through to strongly disagree. So uh, beginning, before we uh, uh, dive into the presentations, um, just a little bit of context uh, in case, you know, there are some on the call who are not as uh, familiar with this uh, issue. Um, essentially, we all know that the Unfortunately, the world's climate is changing much faster than the, even the most scientists expected five years ago. Climate change is obviously, without a doubt, one of the biggest global challenges we face. It's a major risk to sustainable development all around the world and is really threatening global efforts to eradicate poverty. And we've seen this year that all of this is exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And because we are living in very unprecedented times and with COVID really shining the spotlight uh, on the continued need uh, for the financial system to respond to not just the health crisis, but the climate crisis and the economic crisis, and of course, the biodiversity loss crisis as well. So in addition to the very important issue of you know, increased mitigation action and you know, striving to transition to a lower emissions economy, adaptation and climate resilience is absolutely critical uh, to climate response, both now and into the future. So we obviously need adaptation action on all levels and across governments, civil society and the private sector to work together to respond to adaptation needs. An important aspect of this is locally led or community-based adaptation where local communities, organizations and authority are supported uh, and are enabled in adaptation investments uh, and also enabled in the actual leading on decision-making as well. 
But we've also seen that it's actually just a very small percentage of global climate finance that's actually dedicated to this sort of effective, efficient uh, and sustainable sort of locally led uh, engagement. And so this session will focus on the role of multilateral climate funds and the multilateral development banks, which today have to an extent struggled to finance a local adaptation at scale. Uh, and what we see is happening is often that the support is not getting into the, the hands of the local actors and not filtering down from that national support level. Um, but actually this group of climate finance providers actually has a key role to play in financing local climate action and building those strong subnational institutions. So this session will, we will explore some of these examples of more innovative approaches uh, that are emerging. For example, the Asian Development Bank's Community Resilience Partnership Program, the CRPP, which supports countries and communities in Asia and the Pacific to scale up investments in local resilience towards transformational changes, as well as attempts to to be, you know, to siphon funds through the enhanced uh, direct access, uh, for example, through the adaptation fund to get money to the local level. We hope that this session will build uh, your knowledge around how multilateral organisations are designing and implementing these investments for local communities. Um, and I guess what I might do now is to stop there and introduce our first speaker. So first up, we uh, are very happy to have um, Orgio Singha Roy, who's the Senior Climate Change Adaptation Specialist with the Asian Development Bank. Um, he has had more than 17 years of experience in designing and implementing disaster and climate resilience related policies and programs in both Asia and the Pacific. And he has been with the ADB since 2012. He's currently involved in the ADB's efforts to scale up its investments in climate adaptation. So please, Oreo, it's up to you. Thank you so much, Fiona, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you. Um, thanks to the organizers for, for inviting ADB in the session. And as Fiona mentioned, I would like to very briefly introduce a new program which we are developing, rather co-developing, with colleagues from IIED, Wairu Commission, and other organizations. The program is called Community Resilience Partnership Program, and the main objective is how can we strengthen in-country systems for doing more and better at the local level in terms of building resilience. This means engaging, empowering, capacitating local stakeholders starting from national to local level to um, participate and find solutions for resilience. If some of you um, um, attended the very first opening panel of CBA, um, we heard from Dr. Musa, who very rightly talked about how can national systems create the right kind of enabling environment for local actions to flourish. And this is what exactly the objective of this program is, to work with governments to improve their systems so that solutions at the local level can be delivered. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so I will very briefly walk you through three, four key things. One is a bit on why this program is needed and why ADB thinks it's important. Second is what the objective of the program what the program will actually do and how it will deliver. Next slide. So the main objective of the program is to tackle the nexus between poverty and climate risk. And this is important because while countries in Asia and the Pacific has made huge progress in reducing poverty, there are significant number of people who continue to live below the poverty line as well as a huge percentage of them of, of whom hover around the poverty line and gets very easily below the poverty line because of climate shocks and stresses. Thus, it's, um, it's, not, it's not possible to achieve poverty reduction goals if we don't have climate actions at the center of it. This is applicable not just for the least developed countries, which we all know, and the small island developing countries, but also in middle-income countries of Asia and the Pacific, which have huge pockets of poverty, both in rural and urban areas. 
So the program, that's why it focuses specifically on this nexus of poverty and climate. Second, next slide, please. So second issue is, um, can you next slide? Um, the issue of finance. And um, we know it very much. It's nothing new for colleagues who are attending this session that uh, finance is not flowing where it's needed. And we have seen some great work by IIID colleagues on this topic. So the issue is looking at the systems and how can we strengthen the system so the money flows, not in terms of only quality, but the, quant the quantity and quality of money. Next slide. And the third issue, which we think is equally important, is um, when we talk about resilience solutions, they do not automatically challenge inequality. And this is important because sometimes when we develop large scale resilience programs, the metrics which we use to look at performance of those programs, those metrics are not necessarily in favor of the poor and vulnerable population. So it's important to have a program which is dedicated on this nexus of poverty and climate risk and really um, adapts inclusive approaches to deal with the inequality. And this is important for ADB because being a multilateral development bank with a key mandate of poverty reduction, we have been significantly scaling up our own investments in climate adaptation but we feel we need to do more in this aspect, specifically looking at investments which can benefit the, the most vulnerable. Next slide. So with that objective uh, background, so what are the objectives of this proposed program? Next. So essentially through this program, we are trying to create an enabling environment which will allow pro-poor resilience investments to be increased, to be scaled up. And when I say uh, pro-poor, the three types of programs we are looking at. One is programs which directly benefits the poor and vulnerable, such as programs in agriculture, fisheries, urban informal settlements, etc. Second is programs which is allowing money to reach the hands of the poor, like social protection programs, community driven development programs. And third are programs which creates a space for local stakeholders, women and men and local governments to participate in decision making on resilience. These are typically government's decentralization programs. Now, in the context of these programs, it's important to understand that not all programs provide equal opportunities. Some might be more in favor of coping mechanisms, others in terms of incremental adaptation, but do some of them do have more transformational potential and should be harnessed. It's also important to recognize that programs are not all what we call investment projects but we have to adapt different types of modalities like policy-based lending, results-based lending, which looks at the overall outcome and not necessarily the input required to achieve that outcome. Next slide. So with these three types of investments, the CRPP also wants to ensure that we are just not looking at investment and hence it's investment plus plus, where we are looking at initiatives where such investments are anchored, again, national, provincial, local policies and plans, and resourced in terms of budgeting, so the whole issue of mainstreaming, and having a feedback loop of learning from what's being implemented and how that can be improved in, in, in gradually over time. So mainstreaming and learning becomes an important component of CRPP. Next slide. And last but not the least, the importance of strengthening institutions so that resources are flowing. These are talking about national institutions, both public sector and private sector, and how these national institutions can be capacitated to work with local stakeholders, but also to work with international um, community, whether it's a Green Climate Fund through its enhanced direct access modality, and how those systems can be strengthened for resources 
Two, for local level adaptation to flow. Next. So if this is a broad objective, how will this objective be achieved? So what we, next slide. So what we are, um, the program talks about adapting a programmatic approach. So at least 10 years of commitment is needed. Second, we need to focus on investments that look at scale. And when I talk about scale, of course, geographical scaling out is critical, but also the importance of political scaling up where you have small interventions where they make a difference in the local context and actually affects the, the lives, livelihoods, and well-being of the, of the most vulnerable communities. And this importance of programmatic approach has been, um, you know, we have understood it from years of implementation of similar programs, like the pilot program of climate residents under climate investment funds, but also UK government's funded BRACE program. Next slide. So with this programmatic approach, the CRPP essentially will try to do three types of, let's say, simply put it, outputs or activities. One is to help national stakeholders, governments, private sectors, and society organizations on knowledge and action research related work to help them identify the right kind of investments in needed in the course of the wider resilience pathway of a particular country or a province or a sector and make the evidence for such investments. Second, it will help governments prepare bankable projects and see what kind of appetite is there for financial institutions to fund such projects, including through demonstrating pilots. And third, what most importantly, is to build capacity, both within government and local stakeholders to work with each other and build a national capacity on how this can be taken forward. Next slide. So just to put the architecture um, um, in, in one slide, we're talking about setting up a potential trust fund, which will provide resources for knowledge action, for project preparation and capacity building, which would lead to large scale investments on pro-poor development, investments that allow money to reach the hands of the poor, and investments that improves decision making in an inclusive and participatory manner. And it's expected that these investments will lead to a whole pipeline of investments moving forwards, which are large scale, transformational, and allows adaptation solutions to reach the most um, vulnerable population. It's important to recognize that in this architecture, if you really want to have a robust set of transformational in investments, it's important to have the potential investors there's a financing partners right from the beginning in designing the program and in implementing the knowledge project preparation capacity building outputs because then they, that will give them certain level of confidence that the, pro, the projects that are coming out of it can, could be potentially supported by them. Next slide. Now, how the program will be delivered? Next. Recognizing that we are talking about improving in-country systems, so essentially it is that the program has to be country-led. That means the program will look different in each country. So what CRPP in Indonesia could be, would be very different from CRPP in Nepal or Cambodia. And there are a few criteria which we are very keen that once it's, it, it would depend on government's commitment to scale up adaptation and resilience investments and improve systems. Secondly, it looks at governments or countries which have decentralization processes, which allows decision making at the local level, and also governments which have commitments to large scale poverty reduction programs, which could be used as, as useful conduits for building resilience. Next slide. So, the program is very much um, will be delivered through partnerships, and this is absolutely critical looking at the scale of the program, the type of systemic changes um, we anticipate. And this partnership is not among only the implementing partners, but hopefully at national level, partnership between national governments, local governments, community-based organizations, national think tanks, private sector, et cetera. Next slide. 
And I would like to over here um, uh, acknowledge the various partners who have been working very closely with us on the last um, year or so to help um, co-develop this program. And we very much hope that uh, by the beginning of next year, the program will be up and running. And hopefully in the next CBA conference, we'll be able to um, present the first steps taken by the program. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Orgio. That was a fascinating uh, presentation. I particularly liked uh, your ideas around the feedback loop for learning and the mainstreaming, um, and perhaps we will get to expand on some of that uh, through the question and answer session. Um, so I might just ask participants to hold their questions for now, and we might just uh, jump straight into our second uh, presentation. Um, and with that, I would really uh, like to invite um, Mr. Mfenzi uh, Chindangne to uh, give us his presentation. He is from the South African National Biodiversity Institute, also known as SAMBI. Uh, he's the Assistant Director within SAMBI's Adaptation, Policy and the Resourcing Branch. And the branch oversees SAMBI's project development and implementation of the Adaptation Fund and Green Climate Fund projects in South Africa. Uh, he also coordinates and provides oversight of SAMBI's Adaptation Fund Small Grants uh, Facility project. So please, sir, over to you. Um, thank you, Fiona. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, great. I was just getting feedback from my um, computer that my connection is not the best, but um, if maybe my sound starts breaking up, just let me know and I might just turn off my video so that um, I'm audible. Anyway, thank you for uh, the introduction. As Fiona mentioned, my name is Mpundini Chindane and I'm from Sambi, which is uh, the South African National Biodiversity Institute. And um, I will be sharing with you um, Sandy's experiences on, you know, enhanced direct access um, relationship with the Adaptation Fund. So just maybe right off the bat, just to mention that Sandy was accredited with the Adaptation Fund way back in 2014. And um, following uh, project development and implementation of some of the projects which I'll be talking to now, we also got accreditation with the Green Climate Fund in 2016 but as of yet um, um, since our accreditation with the green climate fund we we are still in the process of developing projects some of which are at very advanced stages and we've got um, feedback from the gcf secretariat but uh, nothing on the ground as of yet so i'll be taking you through our lived experiences which um, i think also following the previous speaker there are so many buzzwords which really talk into our lived experiences on the ground. And I'm just worried about time which will really cram it in into 10 minutes, but I'll try my best. And um, it, it's a program of work which I, I really take pride in um, just making sure that the flow of funds really reaches the, the vulnerable people on the ground. All right, um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, following our accreditation with Adaptation Fund and, and as the NIE in South Africa, we have two projects which are currently under implementation. And um, the first one on your left hand side is the Small Grants Facility Project, which, we, which I will be unpacking into more detail um, in the following slides. And um, this is a 12, I mean, this is a 2.5 million US dollar project which intends to, um, which I mean, its intention was to provide about 12 small grants to local communities within two provinces. One called the um, uh, um, Limpopo province, which is northern, uh, which is the northern part of South Africa, right next to Zimbabwe. And the other province is the Northern Cape, um, right next to the Western Cape in Namibia and South Africa. So the approximate um, uh, grant size for each of the projects which I'll, I'll, I'll be um, sharing lessons on was about 100,000 um, US dollars. And then the other big project which we are also implementing is the Umgeni Resilience Project. And this is a project which has been implemented in the Umgeni catchment within the KwaZulu-Natal province. And uh, it's a 7.5 million US dollars project. And its components, as you can see on the screen, uh, providing early warning systems, climate proofing settlements, ecosystem based adaptation approaches at local scale, and climate resilient agriculture. 
So some of the uh, components on the project on, on, on the right hand side have been quite uh, moved due to some of the challenges. Uh, but the climate resilient agriculture component is the one which is really yielding so many results and I think a lot of um, learnings which we are taking into development for upscaling through GCF financing. So, so combined these two projects um, add up to the country cap which the adaptation fund currently has and I do know that uh, there are talks about revisiting the country cap which is set at 10 million US dollars but Sandy has, access, has currently exhausted its um, 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 reach and, and access to the country cap. And we just cross more fingers that maybe more funds are unlocked so that we can keep on doing what we're doing due to the interest which has been unlocked <clears throat> following the implementation of these two projects. Just one more thing on this slide is um, the, the project on the left hand side, which is the small grants facility project is currently undergoing a terminal evaluation exercise. It's um, due to be completed um, in March 2021. This follows um, SANBI requesting a no-cost extension. It was supposed to be completed sometime, um, well, I mean, this month in September. It's a five-year project which started in 2015. So we just had to tie some knots and um, we'll be completing next um, year in, in March. All right, thank you. Next slide, please. So yeah, the Smoke Plants Facility Project one of its criteria was to kind of attract adaptation projects which respond to three investment windows. And um, these were um, uh, projects in climate smart agriculture, climate resilient livelihoods and climate proof settlements. So to really get to these responses, these were involved, these were informed by um, uh, provincial and district vulnerability assessments which were undertaken by our mother department which is the Department of Environmental Affairs. And um, those really um, unlocked and identified key responses which are affecting rural communities on the ground. So when we moved into the implementation space, we really framed our criteria to identify projects within these um, um, three investment windows. I must highlight that, so, so it wasn't kind of explicitly the fact that when we went to identify a project, it must be only responding to one. It could have been, I mean, some of them were responding to two you would find a project in climate smart agriculture with elements of climate proof settlements or the other way around. So which talks to the fact that climate change is not only um, one dimensional, but it really talks to many uh, different uh, and it's cross-sectoral, which, which was also a lesson. And I think we, uh, many people in the, in the room here will concur with that sentiment. All right, um, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so I just wanted to, oh, previous slide, sorry. I think you've just previous slide. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the projects which, ooh, I think there's a delay. I want the, the presentation with um, a myriad of, yeah, that one, thank you, this, this particular one. So I just wanted to give you a, a flavor of the kind of projects which have been implemented on the ground as you will see from the previous um, slide about our investment windows, it talks about agriculture, it talks about settlements and, um, and, and, and livelihoods, um, be it in the form of um, producing crops and, and taking those to market, be it in the form of uh, um, livestock production and rearing those and then taking them to market as well. And um, uh, so, so these are the kind of projects which have been implemented and um, in, in their totality, it, it, it's 12 uh, small grants projects. And um, uh, we had also approved a 13th uh, project, but I mean, due to time, we felt that um, it would be unfair to implement the project uh, um, in, in, in less than a year. So we decided maybe to uh, just top up the grants of these ones, which you are seeing on the screen, so that they could also kind of um, implement more of what they were doing due to the successes which were identified. So next slide, please. Um, so, so the overall target of uh, beneficiaries um, from, from the project document to the Adaptation Fund was um, to, to reach out to about 600 direct beneficiaries. But um, uh, through the implementation of all those um, uh, projects, we uh, were able to reach um, about 1,847 direct beneficiaries on the ground, most of whom were women. And I'm going to emphasize that 
Um, so, so the criteria was also to, to make sure that um, the NGOs which we were contracting and approving projects from really had women in their management structures and also the beneficiaries were also targeting women, which is something uh, which talks to sustainability of, of, of the projects and youth. I'm just sorry that I couldn't lift the number of youth uh, in this slide, but uh, we really reached a, a lot of, of youth um, to, to also build capacity and take learnings into the next generation, which have been identified through the implementation of this project. And um, so some of the interventions there, which talk to the three investment windows, um, talk about climate, uh, I mean, uh, bringing up climate resident livestock, producing climate resident um, robust tea within the Northern Cape province. This is a province which has um, a, 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 a good track record in, in, in producing tea, climate smart vegetable production, as you can see in, on the picture on the background. This was in one of the planting seasons and investment in water security through the uh, installment of rainwater harvesting infrastructure, which also has uh, secondary positive impacts where the rainwater harvested was also um, uh, um, uh, helping in establishing backyard gardens. And um, maybe just one last point on this slide is um, due to the heat in one of the project target areas, some of the livestock uh, farmers really uh, were having challenges in uh, reaching out distance fields in taking their livestock. So one of the responses there was to provide them with mobile um, uh, shelters, which, which was also a, a, a positive uh, impact of the project, which also talked to improving grazing management so that the livestock farmers don't invest and degrade um, rangelands. So it really unlocked some of the uh, project benefits in terms of environmental sustainability. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanna, uh, yeah, due to time, I just uh, pulled up maybe some of the overarching um, project experiences from our uh, from the implementation of these projects and I will be talking to the lessons in the next slide. But um, it's, it's um, really important to, 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 to um, um, think about capacity development when working with local organizations. So community-based organizations were capacitated to develop and implement local and small-scale responses. When we went to finding these projects after a national call and local briefing sessions, there was a huge capacity gap in terms of the general understanding of what adaptation is on the ground. So when we were programming our, our, our um, uh, projects and design in terms of governance, we really made sure that we had local facilitating agencies stationed within both districts, which had somewhat of an idea, but um, which we could build on. And, and then their role was to really handhold some of the NGOs on the ground to really help them develop and implement some of these projects. And um, through the implementation of this project, um, uh, through the enhanced direct access modality, this has really increased country ownership and um, uh, um, to, to also take forward the climate change ad agenda by feeding in lessons from, from what we have un un unlocked here. Sandy is really known for a, 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 its track record in consulting and, and making sure that it doesn't work in silos. So government departments and sector departments were invited to give inputs in the design and also in the implementation where they sit in some of our governance bodies and advise on project changes and maybe challenges when, when, when we were implementing the project. So that really um, emphasized the, the point about country ownership and also going forward when we really look into um, uh, upscaling the project, that it's known and it's not a, a, a new intervention. And then just the last point here, um, uh, the EDA projects complement development. Um, so what we've seen, and uh, it talks to the picture on the, um, on the slide here is, when we were going to some of these areas, uh, some of the communities were um, livestock, breed, uh, I mean, were poultry farmers, but the way their livestock houses um, were being constructed, they didn't really take in con consideration the climate change element. But then through the implementation of this project, we, bring, we brought in experts to make sure that the houses which are built have a climate change design element in them to also make sure that what's being bred is bred sustainably. And um, so just to drive home the point that these aren't just development projects, but they bring in a climate change element in, in here as well. So thank you. And then the next slide. So, so from, from the ground um, coming up to Sandy, which, is the, uh, which was playing the NIE, the NIE role, working with partners on the ground, 
And um, it's good that we are coming to the end of the project where we can really reflect and look back on, on the learnings. So one of the learnings was, was to really undertake a proper due diligence for, of community organizations to, to really reduce challenges in the flow of funds. And this talks to the second point as well, which you have on my screen there, where we had challenges in terms, in terms of, 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 of delays in reporting, because some of these guys just want to do what they do on the ground, but we have to be accountable to the donors. And uh, there was a huge capacity gap in terms of the financial uh, uh, um, reporting capacity on the ground. And thanks to the fact that we had facilitating agencies within both districts, it really helped really uh, reduce the, the, the pressure which we had to work with the NG, uh, small grants recipients on the ground. So um, what, one message here is to really make sure that there is proper due diligence when contracting and identifying these, these projects. And then point number three there is um, both the GCF and Adaptation Fund um, have environmental and social safeguards. Um, that's the term they use in Adaptation Fund and within the GCF, uh, it's ESS. And I think the, um, the meaning there is environmental and social, I mean, ESP, environmental and social policy. But really, they try and frame the fact that when implementing and designing this project, you shouldn't trigger more impacts on the ground. However, when we really program this into implementation, um, the understanding of what these are on the ground was, was really not understood, which uh, brought about challenges. And um, the, the innovation there was to really build somebody's capacity within the national implementing entity to really take up on that role and not really uh, throw it down to the ground. So that's something which we really learned. And um, when upscaling these projects, it's something which will be taken forward so that uh, we don't really bring in more challenges um, and delay implementation on the ground. Um, it talks to the last point I have here, where so the overall small grants facility projects was uh, uh, designed to be a five year project. And uh, within that five year, there was um, an allocation of about two years in, imp in implementation. So if you don't do number one and number two right, you're going to delay the contracting process. And then the actual implementation of activities on the ground will be shrinked to a point where it really um, poses a risk on sustainability. So it's really important to, to, to make sure that you really give enough time for adequate uh, due diligence contracting so that at least um, a, a rule of thumb for projects of this size could be implemented by at least two years. That's, that's just what um, we suggest to, to, to other um, EDA um, uh, um, uh, organizations which want to do uh, small grant making in the future. And I think these are the lessons which through upscaling of this project will be um, taken in cognizance of. Thank you. And the next slide, which I think should be the second last. And then, yeah, key messages, which, which we have here is that adaptation is um, um, a really bottom-up issue where locally tailored responses really talk to sustainability. And um, we've seen that uh, helicoptering projects into communities really trigger their sustainability going forward. So working with these guys on the ground and really building their capacity to, to know the challenges and how they could respond really informed how, how, how to best take this and own it and also make sure that when finances run out and we step out, they can continue doing what they're doing. And then the, just the last point here is, um, this has really sparked interest from other nearby districts where we weren't financing, but just seeing what has been uh, happening in nearby district, um, they, they really took an interest. And um, so the Green Climate Fund has really um, knocked on our doors and, say, and said, please consider submitting another uh, small grants facility project, which we are working on. And uh, we are hoping that by the end of uh, this financial year in South Africa, which ends on the 30th of, of March 2020, 2021, we'll be submitting another GCF projects in, in, in small grant making and taking it to other um, uh, um, district municipalities in South Africa due to the overwhelming um, interest in, in taking this. And maybe just a parting shot is that um, the scale up is not just on, only on implementation, but um, lessons which have been unlocked have been also taken in consideration in district plans and strategies which respond to climate change so that um, uh, people who were not really involved in the uh, nitty gritty are in the know and they could really take up lessons so that this can be replicated. 
I think that's the last slide after this. And um, thank you so much. And this is just me in one of the small grant facility uh, projects up in um, the Mopani district. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. That was a fascinating um, a presentation um, and, you know, no worries about uh, going over time a little bit because I think it's so important to hear, especially uh, about, you know, the lessons learned and the challenges are faced by your, your particular project. And you look like you're having a lot of fun in that photo as well. And also the best of luck um, with, with the GCF and, and the next round of, of funding as well. Oh, thanks. You just brought it back up. Um, look, uh, what we might do now is move to straight to the question and answer session um, and while I try to collate uh, some of the questions that have been sent through the chat function and, and also some of the residual questions that we had here I might just introduce uh, you all to our panelists who will be joining our presenters uh, so firstly we have uh, Leanne Shalatek who is the associate director of the Heinrich Boll Stiftung uh, Foundation in Washington. Uh, she currently focuses on international climate finance with an emphasis on public climate finance flows and on equitable access to climate funding. Uh, she also gives special consideration in her work uh, to gender dimensions of climate change, both adaptation and mitigation, uh, and then also including with respect to climate finance. Um, also joining our panel, we have Mr. Jebru Jemba, uh, who served as the LDC chair uh, from January 2017 to December 2018, uh, and is also a delegate of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Welcome. Uh, he has been involved in negotiations under the UNFCCC since 2008, uh, and now serves as regional lead on MRV, climate diplomacy and institutions development at the Global Green Growth Institute on the Africa and Europe Office, which is based in Ethiopia. And he's also the technical lead for the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, which is called Life AR. So now that we have uh, our presenters and panelists all together, we might just jump uh, straight into some questions. Um, now, there was a few questions relating to the uh, presentations um, and a few that relate uh, just to uh, general issues as well. Um, I might just pull these up. Okay, all right, where are we here? Okay, so um, we might, uh, if you don't mind, um, Zenny, we might go to you first. There are a few questions uh, around your presentation. Um, I might just uh, pose these questions to you uh, as a block um, and perhaps you can answer them um, perhaps uh, in, in, in one go. Uh, and then after that, um, I'll move to some of the other questions on the broader topics as well. So the questions uh, to you are, um, did the funding from the Adaptation Fund last long enough to build the track uh, record required for the GCF funding and to build adequate uh, capabilities over time. That's from Claire from IAED. Uh, Tracy from IAED has also asked, how did you address issues or gender equality and social inclusion uh, to avoid exacerbating vulnerability uh, for those likely to be excluded and getting their voices in the decision making and governance structures? A third question is uh, from Heather from CJRF. Um, do you know if other countries have developed uh, climate small grants funds similar to SAMBI? And the last one um, from Mari from the ODI uh, and CDKN um, asks, can uh, you please tell us about who these local facilitating agents were, um, who were handholding the local NGOs and more about what types of institutions they came from, uh, what specific skills they had and exercise uh, to work as brokers. So that's a lot. Uh, let me know if you uh, need a, a reminder, but um, perhaps uh, Zenzi, I might just pass to you to, to start uh, on, the, on that. All right. Um, thank you, Fiona. In, in, indeed, there, those were a lot of questions, but I think I've taken note of four of them. I might just need a recap on, on only one, um, which was the third one, but um, I'll, I'll try and give it a go at, um, and, uh, and see if maybe the responses at gaps and then we can take a follow up on that. So was the time long enough to really um, kind of build capacity so that we can also take these learnings uh, with our GCF um, uh, application? Yeah, um, this, this kind of is a question where 
we wish we, we had more time because I think every day we keep on uh, finding new stuff which which uh, we could um, really help in the in the development of the GCF projects. Maybe maybe just a, as a reminder is um, in 2018 when when South Africa was hosting the Adaptation Fears Conference, that's when uh, the GCF was interested in us submitting a project in small grant making in South Africa. But by then um, we were only doing our midterm evaluation process. And we really wanted to submit the, 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 the project um, proposal, but we felt there's a lot of unknowns because this was the pilot. Um, unknowns in terms of Sandby's uh, assumptions coming into this, it might be in governance, it might be in money flow, it might be in environmental and, and social safeguards, it might be in um, um, gender um, and, and equity issues. So, yeah, I think five years on average is kind of a, a rule of thumb. And um, we, I think by then, have enough to know how to do this thing um, differently. And although we do have some scratches, which we'll try and avoid if, if, if we were to do it um, uh, again. But um, yeah, I don't think um, that uh, six years or seven years will make a difference in the skills and knowledge which we have right now. That's just the first one to clear. And the, the the other one about decision making, which I think came from T uh, Tracy, um, um, gender equality. So one of the design in terms of uh, that operation fund project was uh, um, to make sure that you, we, we reach out to more women than men. It, it just came in that way as a criteria. So we made sure that through our criteria of identifying projects, one, the projects, uh, I mean, the organizations themselves on the ground have at least women in their management structures, which, which obviously now talk to decision making. And um, I think about 10 of the 12 are run and led by, by um, women. And um, the activities on the ground as well um, really um, are really designed in for, for women empowerment. And I think it's a cultural issue here in South Africa where most of the activities which these projects were, were responding to in terms of climate change historically have been kind of uh, led by women. Um, you might take your agriculture in communal gardens. They are predominantly um, women led. So, so, I mean, it really then uh, um, it talks to equity. And yeah, for, for, for men who may, might have uh, um, felt um, uh, outside of the picture, there was a grievance mechanism just maybe to lodge complaints, but we haven't reached, received any. So, so the, the equity issue was, was um, well received. And then the other question which I have here was how did we find the FAs and their institutional capacities and their skills? So we have two facilitating agencies. The, the one in the um, Mobani district is Conservation South Africa. And its track record was, was mostly, or just maybe just to say predominantly on health. We were really struggling to find organizations which have been implementing uh, climate change responses within the district so that at least they have the know-how to support the, the organizations on the ground. However, within that health organizations, we've, uh, we really found that they have a track record in implementing projects which talks to the uh, investment windows. It might be in agriculture. It might be in, in uh, settlements and food security. So we were also helping more on the FAs to really bring in that climate change argument. So the FA in Mopani had, didn't have a, like 100% skill sets in climate change, but their capacity as well, together with the organizations on the ground has been built immensely. It was much different in the other districts in, um, in, in Namakwa, where the facilitating agency was um, uh, Conservation South Africa. And um, they had a track record in ecosystem-based adaptation interventions, and they had a tr track record in also implementing um, settlement um, responses. So um, also because Conservation South Africa as a part of an international organization, which is CI, it was much easier to, to really um, bring in people within the organization which have skill sets in climate change responses to us or to also build capacity for local NGOs. So those are the two organizations which we which were helping us and hold the grantees on the ground. I don't know if I've missed on the question, Fiona, you might help me. Yes, sure. Let me, sorry, I'll just bring up the chat again. The um, the third question was uh, whether or not, if you know, other countries have developed climate uh, small grants funds similar to SAMBI, and that's from Heather from CJRF. 
Okay, great. Um, Heather, um, I do know about two countries which are implementing small grants projects. One is um, an NIE, also of the Adaptation Fund in Costa Rica, and their projects are at a much bigger scale than ours, and they have more executing entities than we have. I think they have about 20 executing entities. We only have one. So the actual facility and how the money flows is it's a bit different, but the whole intention is to provide small uh, grants to, to local communities. And then the other small grant um, uh, uh, project which I know of is in Namibia, run by, oh goodness, I, I can't remember the name, and I might just pull it up and, and, and share it with you as discussions go. But yeah, those are the two countries which I do know are implementing small grants projects on the ground. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, and and uh, I, th I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in your uh, presentation uh, and I would encourage uh, people to message you uh, directly because I think uh, we are running a little bit oh, just behind time, um, but I, I want to get as many questions as we can. So how we might structure this is um, I'm going to throw a, a, qu a question that we have um, for our, our panelists uh, who didn't present. And then um, if it's okay, uh, Orgeo, I also have uh, some questions uh, for you as well that were sent through the, the chat function. Uh, so um, firstly, uh, perhaps to uh, Jibru and Leanne, um, uh, a question is, uh, you know, how can uh, accredited entities uh, such as international and, and national ones facilitate the engagement of community based organizations, uh, including women's groups, indigenous people's groups um, as executing entities um, and how can they support their capacity building, uh, which is what we've heard in the in the presentations is so important and on the ground learning by doing as the way to prepare them for larger scale uh, implementation uh, down the road. So over to you, Leanne, as you brew on that. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I think that's a very important question. And I think it's starting out with laying out the principles of climate finance and climate finance provision. And with it, I think the responsibilities um, that accredited entities and particularly multilateral accredited entities and MDBs through which most of the climate finance is still flowing have. And I think this is um, what should be a key principle of climate finance, but unfortunately is not right now. And is also unfortunately um, not enshrined in climate finance mechanism as a principle. And what I'm talking about is the principle of um, devolution and subsidiarity, meaning that you're trying to implement at the most local level possible. We have that from other uh, political contexts. If this would be a financing principle that all um, actors, including, for example, multilateral development banks, would have to follow through, that would mean that they would have to look much more actively in bringing in um, some local community groups, uh, local expertise in as um, uh, executing entities, for example. And I think um, approaches uh, just like the one that Sandy um, uh, specified a small grants approach is something that, for example, in a multi-component project that many multilateral development banks um, uh, have with funds, with the green climate funds that all other implementers have, one of those components could very easily be a small grants facility that you bring into a much larger either programmatic context or project context. So I think it's, it's, it's a matter of, of that. Um, also, I think it's much uh, important to think very carefully where um, executing entities that are local groups, women's groups, just have um, uh, so much more advantage. And this is, for example, on issues like community engagement when it comes to um, sharing traditional knowledge and practices. And I think particularly also if you're looking at results uh, management. Um, I think participatory monitoring, those feedback loops about what things are going well, what things are not going well in implementation are probably much, much better done uh, by groups that are on the count, can engage and can actually showcase uh, what is going well and what is not going well. Hello. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, th thank you, Fiona. Uh, before uh, just getting to the your question, I just give you a, a highlight about why life here, which will answer 
so some of the questions that you raised. Uh, basically, uh, if you look at the least developed countries, uh, we, we are the leaders in terms of starting adaptation and resilience related activities. So far, even if there is a limitation in the global climate finance, still billions have been invested in developing countries, uh, including LDCs. But we don't see much impact on the ground. We are in a vicious circle of poverty. So the, first we need to answer the why part. In most of the cases, the MDBs and other financial mechanisms, they measure their uh, success by the amount of money which is dispersed, but that's not the case. If you look at most of the uh, projects and programs which have been implemented so far, it's either a top-down approach, kind of one fits for all kind of approach, who doesn't engage the communities, either it is a sector specific kind of intervention that will have an impact on another sector. So unless you make use of a landscape approach, for instance, if you are working on improving agriculture productivity, should not be under the expense of the forest and other issues. So most of the projects are either sector specific, area specific or time specific. And it's not owned by the communities because planning is done using a top down approach. That approach has resulted in having a number of intermediaries in between. So most of the studies showed that even if billions have been invested, not more than 15% is reaching to the local communities. So first we need to respond to this key issue before we really uh, think of other option. So as a result, uh, we uh, initiated the Life AR with the Least Developed Country Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, which tries to respond to the key challenges. That is moving from business as usual into business unusual way. Uh, I would like to recognize the presentation by Sina and Mubtunzi. Um, it's more or less quite similar. It's a community-based adaptation. It has quite a similar approach. Uh, one thing which I would like to highlight on the second presentation is they, there are a number of unknowns, but the approach in life here, which we are trying to address is, first we need to address the unknowns so that we'll have a national platform to be set up across, uh, so far we have seven full runner countries, which will run for the coming 10 years. Uh, we have a global platform. The national platform will see because we, it needs to be customized into local context. So we will answer the unknowns, how it's managed, the financial flow, uh, selection, the, uh, engaging communities from planning across the value chain. All this needs to happen first. So we are now at the stage of setting a national platform across the seven front line countries. So in that regard, we'll be able to see how we can really maximize. Our goal is to reach 70% of the resource to reach the local community by 2030. In our document, which I can share later on, we have our key asks to the global community and our key offers. We want to be uh, climate neutral by, neutral by 2050. And at the same time, 70% of the resource needs to reach to the local communities by 2030. In that way, the kind of learning by doing exercise where at this point in time, it's a bit challenging to uh, influence multilateral financial sources. But through this process in a small scale project, we can implement and show the case that we can bring a change by implementing small projects this way. That way we will be able to influence both bilateral and multilateral financial sources to adjust themselves in a, in a way that to give more focus to the uh, local community. And in terms of capacity building, I think it's a bit challenging. We always have capacity building component in most of our interventions. Either we do it like a three-day workshop in the meeting halls, whatever. So we just sticking the box kind of exercise. That will, will not change on the ground. So instead we need to think of capacity development rather than capacity building. The how? because most of the elders and developing countries have a number of universities and research centers. If we mainstream the curriculum into, into their curriculum, then I think we'll have a continuous capacity development in these countries. So for that, we have another initiative called LAC, you may be aware, 
which is working across more than 10 universities in the LDC countries. So the intention is to mainstream uh, uh, capacity development as well as the planning, implementation, and reporting in the government system. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jibri. That, that was, um, you know, really interesting um, and, and great uh, to, to hear about uh, you speaking on capacity development and also mainstreaming that in the curriculum. Um, that, that sounds uh, really interesting. Um, look, we're running a little bit over, but I do just want to pose, um, oh, sorry, hang on, what's happened? Um, I do just want to pose uh, a question that we had for Orgio uh, before. Um, we might just have time for one, if that's okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to find the question. There's a lot of chats. Everyone's very interested, which is great. Okay, um, if it's okay with you, Orgio, um, I'll, I'll just pose a question uh, from you through the chat function. And this one is from Vincent uh, from the UK government. Uh, and he is uh, interested to hear uh, what you mean by investing in enabling environment as for many countries this means fundamental investments in infrastructure and basic services uh, to reach the more difficult and hard to reach areas so um, if you're happy to answer that question uh, before we move out to the breakout groups thank you sure thank you and this is a question i think what i meant was um, not just look at investments on infrastructure basic services but rather invest in the institutions, strengthening the institution, in, invest in improving the financial architecture, invest in improving capacity needed to identify solutions and deliver those solutions. And I think these um, investments are critical because they have the potential to unlock further financing, which can then flow for your capital expenditure related work. So I think um, what, we, what we are trying to do through the CRPP program is to find the balance where, of course, we want hard investments, but at the same time, investments to, to improve the enabling environment, which would enable our own investments to leverage furthermore from public sector as well as private sector. Um, and this investment in systems or enabling environment, I think it's more hard to sell. It also requires longer term commitment and different innovative partnerships if you really want to make a change on the ground. So, um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Orgo. Um, I, there, I think there are more questions for you, but I would encourage participants to also uh, engage on the app as, as Barry has a message to everyone. Um, and this way you can have a more of an interactive uh, engagement with all the participants and contributors as well. Um, Thank you, everyone. That was a really fruitful question and answer, and there's clearly lots of interest uh, in the presentations and this uh, issue more broadly. I might throw to Susan now, uh, who will uh, give us some instructions on how we proceed with the, the breakout group. Um, and given the time, I'd suggest that we keep the breakout group to uh, 15 minutes rather than 20 minutes. So over to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, um, for a very, very insightful and provocative session, I must add. And now we are turning over to you, the participants, to pick on some of your wisdom. And Shanda, would you just plug the, yes, the, the questions. So um, we are going to launch out into groups um, so that we can share some of um, of your thoughts around these questions. I'm not going to read them because of time, but uh, just for you to note, you will find a facilitator in your breakout group, but please start with nominating a person who will report back to plenary and consider each question as far as you can within the 15 minutes that we are left with, uh, but very, very importantly, note a few key points from each succinctly to report back because these key messages will be taken forward in various other spaces um, to uh, an inform advocacy. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, would you please now launch us into the breakout groups? 
Yes, uh, I'll launch the breakout groups now. Um, just a quick note to all of the facilitators, if you could do us a massive favor and make sure that you click to uh, record each session. Uh, once it starts, that would be great. Okay, I'm opening the rooms now, so you should be able to join. Thank you. Please click on the join icon to launch in. Hi, is everyone back now? I'm going to take that. Uh, let me have a look. Yeah. So, can you let me know if um, everyone is back now? Um, it looks the rooms like are all closed, so I think um, this is everybody okay. we, uh, we have back. The leftovers. Right. It was a bit of a race against the clock there when that, you know, 30 seconds and then boom, <laughs> we're out. <laughs> um, look, thank, thank you um, so much uh, for, for everyone, you know, in the, your participation to the breakout groups. Uh, we certainly had a very good chat in breakout group number three. Um, so what I might do is invite the nominated um, a feedback person, the rapporteur, to report back uh, on your session. Um, if I could ask you to be brief, keeping it to about 30 seconds to a minute, if possible, to if you have to. Um, so perhaps breakout group one. You can go first. Um, I'm not sure, too sure if I was breakout group one, but I will go first, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll, so uh, I'm paraphrasing massively here. Um, in terms of building the capacity, it's going to be very difficult to predict what the capacity needs actually are going to be. Um, so there does need to be space for learning integrated into the design of the project and then across the whole project cycle. And a lot of it, so, so learning kept on coming up time and time again. And there's a situational analysis that needs to be done at the beginning of a project to understand the gaps, but also capacity needs at the different stages of the project are going to be different. So these will have to be sort of kept an eye on. Um, learning needs to be integrated into the project and, and the incentive structure, the donor incentive structure is normally around results and outputs and needs to be shifted away from that somehow towards not just looking at sort of uh, concrete results and outputs, but also um, looking at learning as a process. So that, that's something that needs to be integrated. And, and one of the big things coming out is that the different groups need to be able, need to learn to work collaboratively. And again, that can be uh, there needs to be capacity building for everybody around that. Um, there was a lot more discussed, so I'm just going to keep it very brief so everyone else can get that going as well. Cheers. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, and uh, let me see. Okay, so we've got uh, Susan for group two. Susan? Yes. Uh, okay, is that me, Susan? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, it was it was uh, Heather, Lion, Jacaria, me, and uh, Chandler was here, and one more person I forgot the name. So basically, what we've been discussing is uh, uh, is is a lot of troubles with the uh, proposal preparation. Uh, so we don't have like the the people doesn't have enough knowledge how to do that properly uh, and that is a very very big lacking needs to be filled up first and also the, like the investment strategy uh, is not is not is also very complicated to to understand to uh, to develop the capacity on the on the on that investment strategy and to make it clear uh, along the intermediaries because uh, when it when it devolves to the community level we can see there is a silos in between the intermediaries. So, uh, so that needs to be actually filled up with proper communication and skill. And we figured out uh, the communication sometimes is not that successful because of lack of willingness is there. And why the willingness is there, that is depending on, that is very much coming from like uh, devolving the funding mechanism and the structure. So that needs to be reoriented uh, across across the different stakeholders and actors working for that. 
So these are the issues that we've been actually talking about uh, pretty much. And anything missing out can be filled up my, by my other teammates. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Um, next, we have uh, the breakout group three, led by Marek, the group that I was in. So I understand Daniel is going to give the feedback for our group. Daniel, over to you. So it doesn't sound like we've got Daniel. So shall I come in and just quickly maybe recap Daniel, but feel free to talk in if, as soon as you can. Um, so what are just a couple of headline points. So the donors uh, really need to provide uh, some more pump priming finance. So we talked a little bit about how can, what does this look like and how can we make it actually happen? And uh, we need to enable more adaptation to happen. We obviously need more investment, whether it's public investment, we didn't really go into that, but on community level infrastructure to allow other actions to take place. Um, there's a, we noticed a real issue around the sustainability of good community-based adaptation initiatives, um, whether that be from local government or the sources, we need to work much harder to ensure those sources of finance continue after the end of the project. Um, and we noted another point around the donors have an important role to steal, uh, steer, sorry, steer MDBs and other intermediaries to increase their appetite and overcome potential perceived issues of a lack of return on investment in local action. And also a good point on the role of MDBs and intermediaries to improve the connections of communities uh, with national actors, with other actors, both horizontally and vertically allow also an increase in appetite of national government also to increase local investment. So those are a few top line messages. Okay, thanks, uh, Mark, and thanks also for your um, a very efficient uh, facilitation of our uh, breakout group. Uh, so next we have a uh, group four, which was, uh, I understand it's uh, Jen giving the readout. Thank you, Jen. Hi, um, so we, um, in, in response to the capacity needs, we, uh, like one of the other groups, recognize first that it's not a one size fits all approach, so flexibility is key. Um, investing in capacities for bottom-up approaches, um, including engaging communities in, in proposal writing, skill building um, around developing budgets um, and M&E, um, and, and scalable planning tools that can be used to um, really ensure meaningful participation of vulnerable communities in the in the selection and design of projects, not just sort of um, counting them among beneficiaries. Um, and and it, within that also youth inclusive processes and financing. Um, reporting requirements can be really stringent. So part of the capacity building is actually also um, flipped. So there also needs to be flexibility in how impact is measured um, you know, adhering to the idea of, of rigor around results, but being creative in, in how that gets captured so that that doesn't become a barrier for communities to participate. Um, and in terms of when a multilateral intervenes, um, the ideal is demand-driven support to um, government or locally controlled processes as opposed to um, the MDB deciding that, that it, it will uh, intervene. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, we recognize that first that there's actually a, a vested interest in MDBs and multilaterals and there's not necessarily an appetite for them to work themselves out of a job. Um, and that re reflects a lack of trust um, in giving money directly to the local level um, and, and a donor comfort in working through those banks. So there's a lot of hurdles to overcome um, and a general acknowledgement that the direction is good, but that, that um, there's inertia to overcome. Um, and it, beyond that, Life AR gives um, a roadmap on how international intermediaries might phase out and transition to those national platforms um, with local control. And if I missed anything, I hope my, my colleagues in group four will pipe up. Oh, thank you, Jen, thank you. Yona, you're, mute. you're muted. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. If Sorry. It's, uh, 
<laughs> is it no supposed worries. to be um which fiona is it sorry maybe the wrong fiona uh i think okay so i think she was talking to me because i was muted and uh obviously trying to talk um but uh i believe fiona you are also presenting for group five so please okay thank you thanks um yeah so in we had a relatively short discussion but one of the things that came up was um that if mdbs are looking at supporting capacity right down at the local level it needs to be for local level capacity to do their own analysis their access and understanding of climate science and their own planning processes and linking up you know, community to local level planning but if we build capacity for those activities at that level then it's in essential that the donors also have the trust to fund the decisions that come out of that so it's um, moving away from predetermining from above top down what communities need um, but allowing for that to emerge and then be funded um, so mechanisms would then be needed to follow through on that and allow that um, and the other thing for the second question we talked about well we don't need any intermediaries to work themselves out of a job they just need to do a much better job and at the moment the situation is that it's projectized and it's about compliance and upward accountability to the donor how do we reverse that so that it's the other way around and the starting point and the central focus is better resilience of all people in the place that we're working and then how do different intermediaries work along a whole chain of intermediation so to speak from the international right down to the local in ways in which they're all serving their constituents below and looking at that downward accountability and looking at empowering decision making at the lowest possible level so it needs kind of a um, turning upside down of the business as usual we have at the moment thanks okay thank you so much fiona and um susan and, and barry i understand uh, that's it it's a five groups is that correct there are no more groups that need to that's correct yeah that's correct. okay yeah. all right thanks so much susan and barry well i mean what a fruitful uh, discussion we've had um i will now attempt to wrap up a you know in a very brief way now that we are a little bit over time but i think that just reflects the richness of the discussion that we've had here today um you know look first we heard from uh Oreo on the adbc rpp um, and and how we can strengthen government systems to create the right kind of enabling environments for local action to really flourish um and then uh, our second presentation by Mbenseni, who also uh, describe some tangible uh, examples of taking adaptation to the ground through small grants facility projects as um, and it was also really interesting to hear in that presentation the project learnings and the challenges and the key takeaways uh, particularly around the importance of uh, due diligence and challenges with uh, compliance and environmental social safeguards of the various funds um, you know we had a very fruitful question and answer session um, and uh, it would be good uh, if uh, the organizers can arrange to, um, to, to have some of those uh, questions that we didn't get to uh, answered in some way um, because I think there were lots of really good questions in there and some that we couldn't quite get to um, and in through the breakout groups so uh, we explored you know obviously ways to redefine MDB approaches to CBA um, and how international intermediaries can potentially work themselves out of the job, although we did hear that there might be some incentives for them not to, um, but lots and lots of ideas and concrete suggestions uh, as well. Um, I'll leave it uh, there in terms of the summing up, but um, I'd like to take this opportunity there to thank you all for your active participation. Um, I've certainly learned a lot and I hope that it was useful to, for you as well. Um, and very lastly, just to note that it was uh, great uh, to see everyone despite the disruptions of COVID and, and to still be able to meet virtually and I wish you uh, all the very best of health in the months and years to come. Uh, thank you very much for having me, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Susan, back to you. you you've said it all Fiona, just to thank you too so much.
for uh, honoring our invitation and all our speakers and panelists for sharing your wisdom and experiences to the volunteers behind the scenes. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Let's keep the conversation going on Hoover and other platforms. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.